So now this is the first milking of the day and she's almost ready. Now in a milking barn, you milk a cow twice a day. That's to get optimum production. Like I said, you can get what, 12, 13, 14 gallons in one day out of this cow. Uh, let's get through this. The answer was some extra content added in Persona 3 FES, and was kind of meant to add a bit of closure to the original game. With that in mind, let's take a brief peek to check out what it actually feels like to play this game. Grind, 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 no! Door, two-headed shadow monster, the end. I should cover it all, right? Ah, fine, I'll get into it. So after the end of Persona 3, the party is understandably a bit down. It's been a few weeks since the events of the game, but it's still hard to believe that the main character really kicked the bucket. In any event, it's almost the beginning of a new school year, and with Hakiko and Mitsuru graduating, the fantastical co-ed dorm that you've spent the past year in is going to be closed and everyone's going to be returning to their ordinary lives. That also includes Igis, who had decided to drop out of school and return to the lab where she had been in storage originally. It seems like ever since the incident, she's been behaving more robotic, let's say. Her emotions are feeling more and more muted, and she stopped dreaming, or even sleeping for that matter. Well, that's probably unimportant. As your group is saying your last goodbyes to each other, you're interrupted by a different robot that you've never seen before, who kicks the crap out of Ken. Fortunately, Igis figures out she's the main character of this game, and that gives her multiple persona powers, and she's able to knock the robot unconscious. And it's here that we get a long exposition dump about what the heck is going on. Basically, everyone's trapped inside the dorm for some reason, and there's a hole in the ground that leads to a place called the Sands of Time. And also that the robot girl is named Metis, and she claims to be Igis' sister. In any event, since he can't leave, the only way forward is through the sands of time, and you basically have to go through a bunch of procedurally generated dungeons in order to escape. At the bottom of each of these dungeons sits a memory of one of your party members, like Ken dealing with the least compassionate police officer possible, Junpei being frustrated with the fact that his dad is deadbeat drunk, oh, and Mitsuru used to wear pigtails. In any event, it eventually comes to light that this dungeon exists basically because everyone is frustrated with how things turned out, and this dungeon can potentially offer the ability to change the past, and offer a new future. But that is where the problems begin to arise, because not everyone agrees on how to use the key. You see, Ken and Akihiko believe that the past should remain the past, and while it's not always good, you shouldn't change it merely to say your own desire. Basically, the death of Shinji made them better people, and they want to move forward with that memory in their mind. Yukari and Mitsuru believe, on the other hand, that if there is a chance to save something precious to you, you have to take it, even if it's slim and there's potential harm in it. You would regret it for the rest of your life if you didn't take that chance. Basically, they really miss their dead fathers, and given the opportunity, would go back and save them. Junpei and Koromaru believe that, hey, maybe we should just all take like 20 minutes and just kinda cool our heads a little bit. You know, come back and talk about this rationally when we're not all in the middle of a heated argument. Uh, his side. I, I choose his side. Can I stay with them? Yes, so uh, rationally the only solution to this problem is trial by gladiatorial combat. I guess isn't really sure what she thinks, and Metis just kind of follows her wherever she goes, but they end up entering the tournament as well for some reason. And you eventually end up defeating everyone. But it's okay, they survive somehow, and I guess has the grand idea that maybe we should just go back in time and check whether we should change the past first before deciding on anything. That, hey, maybe we should go see what happened to protagonist Kun when he died, rather than just immediately making the choice to fuck with the timeline. So you wipe your friend's blood off your autocannons and head off to check out what's behind the door. Whereupon you find another door. Hooray! We finally made it to Slick Jesus. 
So it turns out after he died, he became a physical barrier that is designed to stop the darkness in humans' emotions from reaching Nyx and causing the fall. You know, for a series that's almost always built around the consciousness of humanity, this is weirdly meta. Anyways, you defeat this week's personification of human emotion that's attacking him, save the day, realize that you all should just be friends, find out that Metis was Igus's emotions gone rogue the entire time, and live happily ever after. Until Arena comes out. So Arena has that same problem that every fighting game has, in that the story is kind of a disconnected mess shown through the view of all the different characters. But let's try to summarize, shall we? So first off, the Seas gang is all grown up now, and part of them has started working together. Namely, Cruella de Dominatrix, the road warrior, I guess but with a tie, and... Damn, be careful you make fun of in a high school. Anyways, they're all escorting a currently offline anti-shadow weapon, the same thing as what Igus is, when it suddenly is hijacked by a mysterious entity. The group follow the thief, which eventually leads them to the TV world inside of Inaba. Oh, also Naoto is following them. Meanwhile, you, that's you Narukami, not you main character Silent Jones, because he's not silent anymore, has returned to Inaba where he's meeting with his old friends and family, only to find that the Midnight Channel has returned and for some reason this time it's gone full WWE. Oh, and Elizabeth is around too, I guess. Uh, she shows off that she could have done everything we did in the answer in a fraction of the time. That's cool, I guess. Glad to know that could have been avoided. Anyways, after a bunch of gratuitous fighting, we eventually come to what is actually the main plot of this game. The robot with the surprisingly adorable Jersey accent, Labrys. Basically, while she was being created, it was decided that the best way to improve her combat capabilities was killing all of her siblings in gladiatorial combat. Why? Why was I programmed to feel pain? Well, unsurprisingly, after being thrown inside the TV, a shadow developed from all the dark shit she'd been put through, and it was the thing that created this whole arena, so that others could experience the pain that she had. Fun. Anyway, eventually everyone comes together and defeat Shadow Labrys and help her to become her own person with her own persona. Only here's where we start to find the real masterminds behind everything, and we move into the Ultimax storyline. You see, Labrys was captured and thrown into the TV for a reason by this split personality mofo, Sho. He's basically the lost member of Strega and had all sorts of fucked up shit done to him while he was a child by that bastard Akutsuki. But he went into a prolonged coma and ended up missing the events of Persona 3, but now he's back and decided that nobody but him deserves to be alive anymore. So he wants to erase everyone else from existence, and to do that, he teams up with some entity representing the culmination of some human emotion again. It's Persona, so of course he did that. Anyways, they had Labrys set up this whole arena so that they could have a place where powerful Persona users would fight shadow versions of themselves. This would in turn slowly scrape away at their minds, which again in turn would scrape away at their Personas, creating powerful shadows in the process. And with powerful shadows, something something, end of the world. Anyways, more fighting ensues, the rest of the Persona 3 cast is flown in, and Adachi's here for some reason. But eventually, all of you come together, Sho is defeated, and the world is saved. Of course, since Sho has a tragic backstory, he kind of gets redeemed, and the crews of 3 and 4 get to sit down and finally have a nice chat. Well, now that we're done with the Blast Blue ripoff, we can move on to the Etrian Odyssey ripoff that is Persona Q. So, unlike the previous game, which is set after the events of Persona 3 and 4, this one is sent concurrent to the events of both games. Although it's kind of in an alternate dimension, I guess. So, during that one typhoon where you got really sick in Persona 3, and the school festival in Persona 4, both groups are suddenly transported to Yasogami High School. Only it's not the Yasogami High that the P4 cast knows. It's similar, but there's something off about it. Also, you can't leave the school, and time doesn't really seem to advance in this world. So, fun stuff. Anyways, it's now that our group happens upon an odd pair named Zen and Rei. Zen's the epitome of the dark brooding loner type, and Rei... eats a lot, I guess. 
The two of them inform you that, hey, good news, there's four dangerous labyrinths with powerful monsters in them. Don't know what they're here for, but hey, it's not like you have anything better to do. Oh, and there's also this door that looks like it's the way out of this dump, but there's four unbreakable locks on it. What a conundrum we have here. So of course you have to traverse the four labyrinths to unlock the lock so that you can escape. As you're doing this, Zen and Ray start to remember things that they didn't realize they'd forgotten. And it's a long tale to be sure, but let's just cut straight to the end, shall we? It turns out Ray's been dead this entire time. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. And it turns out Zen is basically the Grim Reaper. I mean, he's not actually the Grim Reaper, the Reaper is an FOE, but he's the one who ferries the dead souls into the afterlife. Anyways, Ray had basically been sick her entire life and spent pretty much all of it in a hospital constantly being treated. So when Zen showed up to her and said, hey, you're dead, let's get going, she kind of fell into a pit of absolute despair because, hey, guess what, boys and girls? Life is meaningless. <sighs> oh boy. So Zen, being a god of death and time and what have you, was surprisingly interested in Nico, her real name is Nico by the way, and wanted to find out what made her so sad. So he created this world of what she wanted, basically normal school life, and tried to get her to come out of her shell. And eventually he figured out that he did actually kind of like the girl and wanted to help her, but she's dead and you kind of can't fight the laws of nature. So he decided instead to erase both her and his own memories and isolate this little world away from the rest of reality and let Ray live a happy life. Anyways, by going through the dungeons, you basically started up Zen's failsafe and restored their memory, which in turn awakens a part of Zen called Kronos that wants to fulfill its original purpose, and it tries to drag Ray off into the afterlife. So the rest of your party quickly put a stop to him so that Ray can still go to the afterlife. Okay. But of course, the important thing here is Rei realizes that her life wasn't pointless after all, and she and Zen get to be happy in whatever the afterlife actually is. It's a sweet little moment, and the rest of your group get to go home happy. Only to have all your memories erased so that all of this can be canon. Quickly, in here! Who's driving? Oh my god, Bear's driving! How can that be? Now, Persona Q2 came out quite a while after the first one, so much so that a whole new actual Persona came into existence. So now we get a game that's focused on the Persona 5 crew and also kind of features the cast from 3 and 4. So the Phantom Thieves are chilling out sometime before entering Sai's dungeon and decide to hit up Mementos. Only this time something strange happens. Well, more strange than usual when you're hanging out in the consciousness of all humanity. You're transported to a strange world full of weird, goopy monsters called shadows. What kind of Kingdom Hearts crap is this? We fight demons in Persona, goddammit. Anyways, it's quickly revealed that you're trapped inside a theater this time, but much like the last game, there's a door with four unbreakable locks on it, and oh look, four convenient labyrinths to explore. This time, instead of a mopey goth and a fluffy eating machine, we get Nagi, who's kind of got a Mrs. Robinson vibe going on, and Hikari, who's shy? I don't know, she's kind of like Futaba, but without any of the spunky gamer charm. The two of them claim that they are trapped in the theater just like you, but unlike Zen and Ray, don't offer to help you find your way out and instead stay content to watch from the sideline. The labyrinths are movies this time around and actually have their own plots around them, rather than just being a vaguely symbolic means to an end. While they're all different enough, for the most part they all have a pretty similar resolution. Basically, a large group of somethings thinks that things need to be done a certain way. One individual tries to act differently, which in turn leads to the group shunning them. Until, of course, the Phantom Thieves and friends show up and you show that individuality is important and you shouldn't blindly follow the masses. You defeat the boss and the movie comes to an end. This comes to a head in the final dungeon, where you find out that this whole labyrinth has basically been part of Hikari's subconscious. Not all that surprising in hindsight. The reason for this is because certain experiences in her life have given her a distorted image on how she should think. Thinking that she shouldn't speak out against the majority, that as long as enough people agree on something then it's okay to do it. But thanks to your group's efforts, you're eventually able to prove to Hikari that she can think for herself, and that individual thought is important, and that she does have people who care about her. And so, Hikari learns her lesson, becomes stronger as a person, and the group happily leaves the theater to find... Man, 
Hollywood's really gone downhill. No, it turns out that Nagy herself was the entity that's acting on behalf of humans' emotions. And she's actually keeping hundreds upon thousands of people in theaters similar to Hikari's, ones where they're trapped by some of their darkest emotions. But she also is more than happy to let a lot of you leave. Sure, she trapped Hikari in this place, but it was only to protect her from the world around her and all those emotions that caused her pain. Now that she's figured out how to walk in her own two feet, she doesn't need the theater anymore and she can go back and be happy in the real world. Eh, say la vie. Maggie's more than happy to let her go and just go back to looking after the others in her care. So, of course, your group think that, hey, we should probably help all these people. Sitting in a dark theater that constantly reinforces your darkest emotions might not be the healthiest thing in the world. So you head off through the world to catch up with Nagi. You eventually find her, defeat her, prove to her that humanity isn't as weak as it first appears, send everyone back to their own realities, have your memories erased once more, and have your happy ending. Alright, I think that about covers everything. Thank you all for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, and I... Uh... And you are... I am the Shadow, the true self. Yeah, you do realize that most people really don't give a shit about these little skits that YouTubers put out to try to lengthen their videos. And yet, my very existence proves that you are complicit in following that very trend. I... well, I mean, it, what do you want? My wish is to see the completion, the end, the one dark secret you're left hiding. For I am you. No, no, I swore I would never talk about that. Not again. And yet, for as long as you continue to deny it, my existence shall remain. But you don't end your gun. Alright, here it is. So this game starts with you and Naoto visiting Risei, who's gone back into the idol business. For a weird game concept, this actually makes a lot of sense. Risei is literally an idol, so it's not hard to imagine her setting up a dance thing with her friends. You know what? I'm on board. Anyways, as they're visiting her, they meet with one of Risei's idol friends, a girl named Kanami. Unfortunately, it seems like members of her idol group have gone missing for some reason. And well, since Naoto's a detective and you once helped her be a detective that one time in a support, you both decide to look into it. What happens is you eventually happen upon a certain video and... Well, this is Persona 4, so you gotta know where this is going, right? Yep, they get sucked inside the TV. Only it's not the same world as the TV world that they're used to. There are shadows, but you can't seem to fight them. But don't you worry, because you have something even better than weapons to defeat these shadows, these literal manifestations of the darkness inherent in humanity. Come, Persona! Mm-hmm. You defeat them with the power of dance. But come on, Fire Scale, it's a rhythm game. Just because you're a big old grumpy guts doesn't mean you have to rain on the parade of people who enjoy this kind of thing. <sighs> Look, I know, I know, it's a dancing game. Obviously, it's gonna be goofy, wacky, and over the top, but just... <sighs> Let's just continue. So, while your group investigate the video world to try and find out what happened to the missing band members, Konami plays damage control in the real world to buy you guys some time. And what follows is a whole bunch of wacky antics and choreographed dance numbers, and it goes on and, uh... Look, I, I'm sorry, I, I just know what's about to happen, okay? And I'm having a little bit of trouble keeping it together. I just need something... Happy, something nice. Something to remind me that ultimately this is a good world that we're living in and life is worth living. Do you think I can do this one too? Just do Every it like you guys do. You'll be fine. Here. <laughs> it's perfect. Okay, let's stop 
beating around the bush then, shall we? So, eventually the question arises, what the heck is causing all of this? And well, judging from past experiences, it seems pretty obvious that probably something to do with someone's shadow. And well, we only know one new person, so it's probably gonna be her. But why exactly has a shadow form? It's always some dark secret they pretend doesn't exist, some part of their self that they want to avoid, but what could it be this time? inspired me not to give up. I did my best. <gasps> but... Uh, what I saw was... Yuko-san just had to always be shining. No, having all those problems wasn't right at all. That's why... Hey gang, so in today's meeting we're gonna decide what we should put in the upcoming game, Persona 4, Dancing All Night. Any suggestions? Henderson? I think we should remix a bunch of classical Persona songs in new and interesting ways. Alright, that's pretty much a given at this point, but hey, good to hear it. How about you, Jeffries? Well, it is a Persona game, right? So we could add maybe a whole mystery element to it. Give the game an actual plot, don't you know? Hmm, well, that is pretty unheard of in the rhythm game market, but it is also a Persona game. So you know what? Good work, Jeffries. I think that's a very good idea. Okay, uh, Jenkins, what do you think? I think the girls need skimpier outfits. Okay, well, I mean, there is going to be a pretty perverted demographic looking into this game, so it might be a good idea to throw that kind of thing in. Uh, how about you, Solomon? What do you think? I thought we could remind people about the vast emptiness within the human soul. Oh, well, that's a little bit of a different tone than we were thinking about with this dancing rhythm game. Uh, what were you thinking to show that off? Oh, well, I thought perhaps we could show off just how deeply depressing the Japanese idol business is. Hmm, well, I'll bring it up with the higher-ups and we'll see what they think. Do you think we should give Nanako a skimpy outfit? Shut the fuck up, Jenkins! Hooray! So here we are, the dark well of depression the Persona 4 dancing has wrought on the world. After that, the game just sort of moves on. You go back to your funky dance beats and eventually defeat the final boss with one climactic dance-off and everyone goes back to being happy. And that's never going to erase the dark stain that's etched permanently onto my mind. But whatever, we push the pain deep, deep, deep within ourselves and we move on. Much like Atlas did, and we eventually come to Persona 3 and 5 dancing. And, well, unlike the last game, there's not really much of a plot at all. Basically, the twins and Elizabeth got jealous of Margaret's group getting to have a dance competition and forced their own little peons to compete in their own. And that's it. What follows is a whole bunch of character interaction and no real substance, but hey, at least the tone is fucking consistent. And there we have it, in the end of this whole video, ugh, kinda got off track, but whatever, at least it's over, I got through it all, and I hope that you're... Oh, what the hell are you still doing here? What was that? That was the dark secret you said I needed to let out, the thing I was hiding from everyone. You call that dark? One little mention of suicide and you're bawling like a newborn. Well, but I mean... No! You still have yet to tap into the truly dark part of your memory. The darkest secret that this series has to offer. But I... I mean, I covered everything. There are no other spin-offs aside from that one online multiplayer game that was only released in Japan. I sure as hell ain't talking about that. <laughs> Perhaps this could jog your memory. What the? Oh, sorry, uh, not that. Uh, hold on a minute. Aha! Perhaps this could jog your memory. 
Perhaps this could jog your memory. Oh no.